The first lesson for this Reformation Sunday, which will also serve as our sermon text, or a portion of it will serve as our, our sermon text, is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verses 19 through 24. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that, uh, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel is recorded for us in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, the first six verses. Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and mercy and peace belong to you through the merits of Jesus Christ, God's Son, and our Savior. Amen. The text for our consideration this morning is the last half of, of the first lesson, the first reading from Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. We'll, we'll, we'll get a little bit of context from Acts chapter 3 as well and focus on really what Reformation is still all about, and that is not just by grace alone, through faith alone, and this shown in scriptures alone, but Christ, again, who is that underlying thing that underlines and is the bottom line for all of those things. Dear brothers and dear sisters, in Christ Jesus, who is our Lord and our Savior, the only way to heaven, the only way that people can hope to get to heaven someday. You've probably heard this story, <clears throat> and I believe that it's probably the same in every single Sunday school that has ever ever had a Sunday school in a church. The pre-K teacher, the first and second grade teacher, goes through the lesson, asks some questions to try to reinforce what those children have been taught, and every answer to every question, no matter what story it is, is what? I think it's the same way. I've, if I had some Sunday school teachers this morning, I'd ask them, Jesus, isn't it? They've known from past Sunday school stories that if you answer Jesus,
to the question, you're probably going to be right, I would say, 65, 75% of the time. And so they have, been, they have been conditioned to answer every question with the word Jesus. I know, I know, Jesus. Now, if I were teaching that Sunday school, cl school class, you know what I'd be tempted to do? You know, kids, not every answer to every single question is always going to be Jesus. Hope, hoping to get a little bit more specific on that particular story. Give me some facts. Give me some, some application for this particular story. But if you really think about it, at the end of the day, is that really such a bad answer to just about anything? This year we celebrate, we have been celebrating 500 years of the Lutheran Reformation. What was it? I've encouraged people to, to learn more about what the Reformation was all about, whether that's by Bible study, whether that's by, by reading the bulletin inserts that we've been having, whether that's been watching the video or the movie, the new movie that's been out. What was the Lutheran Reformation that started about 500 years ago on October 31st, last sun, or last week, Tuesday. Some people have boiled it down to those three words. It is by grace that we have been saved through faith, and we find those truths in Scripture alone. We don't find those truths in any other from any other source. Now, those are fine and good, but God's grace is shown most clearly in what? Or in whom, I should say? Jesus. You don't find God's grace any clearer than when you see the cross of Jesus 2,000 years ago when Jesus died. That shows God's grace better than any other act this world has ever seen. Through faith in what are we saved? Is it through faith in faith itself? I've got faith. What does that mean when people say, I've got faith? Oh, you just got to have faith when you're going through a, a, a trial or a circumstance that is, that is unpleasant at the time. What does it mean, I've got faith? You got to have more faith. No, it's faith in the object. The faith, the object of our faith is Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ saves. And in every single confirmation class, that I think I've ever taught, if we don't get to it on the very first day, we get to it in the second day, what is the purpose of all of God's word from Genesis to Revelation? Is it to show us how to live a good life like I would guess a majority of the American population believes? Oh, it kind of shows us this is the way to live. This is how we should, we should, how, how we should live a, a good godly life. That's not the only, that's not the most important purpose of Scripture. The most important purpose of Scripture is to introduce us to Jesus. And so if you take Jesus out of the equation, faith and, and grace and Scripture, that means really nothing. But if you really focus on those three watchwords of the Reformation, the bottom line that underlies all of those, without Jesus, they mean nothing. And, and so that's why today we're going to, focus our attention on the fact that it is grace that God has shown us in Jesus Christ. It is faith in Jesus Christ. It is the scriptures that testify about Jesus Christ more than anything else. That's our focus. What is Reformation all about? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus, our Savior. It, it was one of those post-Easter, post-Pentecost days in Jerusalem and the church, the Christian church, this brand new church was growing by leaps and bounds. Previous on Pentecost, we know that the, the church grew by 3,000 in one day because 3,000 people were baptized. Now in our text, it tells us that at this particular time, the church was 5,000 men, not including the women and children. So the church was growing by leaps and bounds. Those disciples were evidently doing what Jesus had commissioned them to be doing. Go and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. They were doing that. Jesus had even given them power to miracles, to do miracles. And, and, and so one day in Jerusalem, Peter and John <clears throat> were tag teaming and they were entering the city of Jerusalem through one of the gates called Beautiful, one of the many gates that surround Jerusalem that you can enter or exit the city of Jerusalem. As they were going through the archway, they saw a man that was lying there, that was sitting there, 
don't know if he had a cup like you classic see in, in, in the movies. Can, can you spare a dime or, or can you give me some, some donation? But he was begging because we are told that he was a cripple from birth. He had never, ever been able to walk. And so he begs Peter and John as they come past him, as he had been doing for years to support him and support his lifestyle. Lifestyle. They beg for some money. Now, now that's what they did. That's what beggars did. They, they asked for people to be nice to them and, and, and hopefully give them out of the charity of their own hearts. When, when, when this man, they asked Peter and John, and Peter and John replied by saying this. Peter says, silver and gold we don't have. <clears throat> we don't have that to give to you. We're not going to drop that in your hand. But what we do have is actually more important and of much greater use to you than silver or gold. And then he told them to, or he told the man to rise up and walk. Very simple. Rise and walk. And at that point, the man who had never walked a day in his life started not only walking, but jumping up and down, kind of like the Badgers on home games during the jump around section. That's what this man was doing. He was jumping around, praising the God who had given him his legs back. Now, as you can imagine, the word spread, and a crowd formed, and Peter and John were called to account. They were called to account by the authorities, the religious authorities in Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, Caiaphas, Annas, all the people that were, that were instrumental characters in putting Jesus to death, not too much longer before this. But they called Peter and John to account. And they asked him, how in the world did you perform this miraculous healing? And this is what they said. Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness that we had made this man walk? They continued by saying, it is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him, through Jesus, that, this, that, this, that has given this man complete healing. Now, now it's interesting to note that when they first got together, when Peter and John first saw that man, when Peter and John first came into contact with him, do you know what they said to the man? He said, look at us. That's what Peter told the man. Look at us. He was trying to get the man's attention, that crippled man's attention, and, 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 and tell him what they were going to tell him. But now, after the miracle has been performed, the focus was not on look at us. It was, if you're looking for the person who made this miracle possible to make this man walk, don't look at us at all. It is by Jesus' name and faith in him that this man is before you walking and healing. Now, not, not everybody who, who was there in Jerusalem was so impressed because those religious leaders that I spoke about before they called Peter and John to account, and they threw them in prison for a night. The very next day, they brought them before this group of, of important, authoritative religious leaders, and they asked him again, by what power did this man come into the ability to walk? How did you do this? Peter then gave this answer. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. The only way that Peter and John were able to work this miracle was by their connection to Jesus of Nazareth. And, and, and did you catch what Peter and John said? The, the one, the same one that not too long ago, about a month ago, you crucified, but God raised him from the dead. This same Jesus that you got rid of because he was a thorn in your flesh for the last three years, this same Jesus, that's the reason that this man is healed. He's the only one that can heal. But more importantly, he's the only one that can save. You've heard me say before, and I, I, I do try to emphasize this in confirmation class, that there's really only two basic religions in the world and that's not the, the first time that that observation has been made. Really, if you boil all religions in the world down into two categories, you'll find this. The first category is this. <clears throat> you must contribute to your salvation in some 
form or fashion, in some small way. If it's not 50%, maybe 25%, God starts you off on a good path, but you must complete that good work by your own good works. And so whether the percentage is 25, 75, or 5, 95, it doesn't really matter. Even if it's 1% me and 99% God, that's the one religion. Something has to come from me in order for me to see heaven someday. And, and, and so we resort to ourselves, and we resort to our works, and we resort to our volunteerism. And we resort to what a good person I am for the most part. And we resort to look at me compared to this other person. I'm really better than that person. Or we resort to our church attendance. I, I'm in church most of the time, God. Or we resort to our contributions. Whatever it is, we rely on that a little bit for our salvation. That's an example of the first religion. I will get to heaven based at least partially on what I contribute to my salvation. But take a look at what scripture says. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Just before that, Peter had said, you know, the stone that you builders rejected has become the capstone. We talked about that in the last couple of weeks in our sermons. <clears throat> Just picture a building project. Picture a, a mason especially. A mason has to be a very careful person, doesn't he? Because that foundation that he lays, that 90 degree corner that he starts, that has to be a good good 90 degree angle it has to be a good perfect stone because everything else flows from that cornerstone or that capstone that's jesus everybody else in the world rejected him when he came to this world the first time but jesus tells us himself that he is the one that has become that cornerstone that foundation building block for the whole church that we know of today that's the second religion it's not 1% us and 99% Jesus. It's 100% Jesus and 0% us. We just believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Now, now you think that the average person would be rejoicing and jumping around just like this beggar had done because we don't have to rely on ourselves. We don't have to put the onus on ourselves whatsoever. No penance no doing this, no doing that, no paying for this or that. You'd think that it be happy for us that it doesn't depend on us. But that's exactly what the world says is wrong. The world says, no, you have to pay for something. You have to contribute in, at least in a little way. But the clear words of God say otherwise. No one else can pay for sin. I can't pay for my sins. I can't go to that cross and pay for my sins or the world's sins especially. Only Jesus could have conquered death for me. Only Jesus made the claim that my, sin, my, my perfect life is going to take away your sins. And only Jesus came through with that promise. Peter and John knew that. <clears throat> and it was because of that message that they would preach that message for the rest of their life. Because they had seen Jesus in the flesh for three years, living, suffering, and dying for their sake and for their forgiveness. Martin Luther knew that, and that's what he spent his whole life, especially the last part of his life, preaching and defending and confessing. And that's really kind of brings it full circle today. <clears throat> we, don't, we don't talk about Martin Luther on Reformation Sunday, except for the historical context that we get through him. I, I've had many conversations just this past year with people who say, why in the world, if we call ourselves a Christian church, why are we focusing so much on Martin Luther? Yeah, I know we're Lutherans. What does that mean? Do we really believe in Martin Luther? Are we putting our faith in Martin Luther? N not at all. But what we are doing is taking the faith that Martin Luther confessed so clearly in his teaching, in his preaching, in his writing, and we're saying this is the way to heaven. Because Martin Luther hated the fact that people were being called Lutherans. 
He hated the fact that, that his detractors were saying, oh, look at those Lutherans. He says, don't call people that follow my teaching Lutherans. If you're going to call them anything, call them Christians. Because it's my, not my name that saves, it's Jesus, Christ's name that saves. And so we see that throughout his whole life, and in, even on his deathbed, in, in, on February 15th, 1546, three days before Martin Luther died, he stood in the pulpit in Eisleben, and he preached on Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. Do you, do you know the verses? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And this is what Martin Luther said in that sermon. He said, if you want to teach or preach Christ to me, I will listen to you. If you're not going to teach or preach Christ to me, forget it. I will not listen to you. And that's really the sum and substance of the Reformation. Yes, it is by God's grace that we have been saved. Yes, it is through faith in Jesus Christ that we have been saved. Yes, the Bible tells us, those holy scriptures tell us all of this. And the bottom line is that. For Luther, it was all about Jesus only. Same thing for Peter and John. May the same thing be said about us for all the days of our life. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.